Hey everyone, let's discuss SIBO or small intestinal bacterial overgrowth and what this means to your health and a few things that are simple and natural you can do to improve it. Welcome to Dr. Ruscio Radio, providing practical science-based insights into health, exploring the importance of nutrition, lifestyle, and gut health through conversations with experts, research reviews, and personal stories. We break through the bias and the noise to bring you simple, trustworthy information that matters. SIBO, as the name implies, indicates there is an inappropriately elevated level of bacteria in the small intestine. There should be roughly 50,000 units of bacteria in the small intestine. And when this overgrowth occurs, we shift from what should be a commensal or symbiotic relationship with these bacteria to one that's more detrimental or pathogenic. The fact that this occurs in the small intestine is noteworthy and important because Remember that the small intestine is 22 feet in length, whereas the large intestine is only five feet in length. In fact, the surface of the small intestine is so absorbative that it's about 2,500 square feet, about the size of a tennis court of absorption capacity. And this is why 95% of calories and nutrients are absorbed in the small intestine. Now, as we have this membrane that is absorbing these nutrients and these calories, we also need to have policing of the traffic through. This is why 70% of your immune system is actually in the small intestine. And it's these tie-ins to absorption of nutrients and the immune system, therefore inflammation, which is how SIBO or other similar imbalances in the small intestine can lead to such a, a seemingly broad and maybe even unrelated array of symptoms. And if we do kind of a top-down scan, we can run through some of these. First, starting with the brain. We know that malabsorption, let's say, of B12 can firstly co-accompany SIBO, but can also lead to things like brain fog, poor sleep, poor memory, even things like nerve pain. Hey everyone, just wanted to make a quick note here that I did publish a paper on this in 2019 in Alternative Therapies in Health and Medicine on SIBO. And we have currently under publication review a trial in which we used herbal antimicrobial therapy in the treatment of SIBO. So again, just a quick mention of the scientific research we have published here thus far. Really exciting research this year has correlated what's happening in the small intestine to what's happening in the brain through two other mechanisms. One, through inflammation. And this inflammation in the small intestine can also activate inflammation through cells known as microglial cells, essentially immune cells in the brain that correlate with things like brain fog and poor mood. But not only that, we're seeing a connection between what's happening in the small intestine and this region of your brain known as the limbic system, and specifically two areas within the limbic system, specifically the hippocampus and the amygdala, have been studied this year and shown through functional MRI imaging scans to be overactive when there are issues in the small intestine. And this can lead to things like anxiety, depression, and poor memory. And by the way, these things are very able to be remedied, but I just wanna cover with you sort of how this connects first so you can understand that, and then we'll give you some safe and natural and simple things you can do at home to start improving these things. So kind of continuing with what are the symptoms that SIBO manifests as, there's also been some very interesting research just this year, again, in, in 2023, showing connections between what's known as the cortisol awakening response and what's going on in the small intestine. Now, if you're someone who has a hard time getting up and getting going in the morning and you feel like, oh, if I don't have coffee, I can't, I can't think, I can't move, I can't, I can't do whatever, this could mean that your cortisol awakening response, which should be the sort of robust output of cortisol to get you up and out the door, so to speak, is aberrant. And, and thankfully, there are things that can be done to improve that. Hey, everyone, by the way, if this video has been helpful, please comment, like, and subscribe, especially the comments are very helpful for me to hear what you find noteworthy and what questions that you have. There's also connections between SIBO and thyroid autoimmunity, showing a slightly increased level of TPO antibodies in those with SIBO.
If we come to the skin, there's a connection to psoriasis and rosacea. There's a connection to restless leg. There's a connection to joint pain. And obviously this happening in the small intestine and the bacteria therein causing fermentation and gas and inflammation can lead to things like bloating, pain, abdominal pressure, altered bowel function. Depending on what sort of bacteria overgrow, you can have diarrhea, you can have constipation, or you might have what's known as a mixed type where there's oscillation between the two. And even connections with metabolism of female hormones, I guess coming back up to the GI system, reflux would be another one. And SIBO has even been correlated with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and a slowing of metabolism. So the main point here is because the small intestine interfaces with so many crucial functions, absorption of nutrition, absorption of calories, and the immune system and therefore inflammation, it can impact many systems and lead to many different symptoms. So depending on how you look at this, it's actually a really good thing in terms of it could be the cause of many symptoms. If you take a really broad view on the research literature, and, and I'll just put sort of rapid fire up here, a number of papers that have looked at prevalence, you see anywhere between roughly a 30 to 40% SIBO positive rate amongst these various conditions I've outlined. Sometimes it's higher, actually in chronic fatigue, one study found about an 80% correlation. When it comes to digestive symptoms specifically, there's about a 35, 37% correlation between SIBO and these symptoms. So if you want to get a rough estimation of if you have those symptoms, what is the probability of having SIBO? Again, a, a rough estimate here would be about 30 to 40%. So this then begs the question, well, what causes SIBO? There's a few hypotheses on this. Let's just run through them really quickly. The first one by Richard McCallum. It, and Richard McCallum has been on the podcast a couple of years back, a uh, very astute gastroenterologist. And he and, and the researchers in the study group found an overgrowth of oral cavity bacteria overgrowing in the small intestine, leading McCallum to posit that it's probably, at least in part, low hydrochloric acid or stomach acid release, not killing off the bacteria that should be killed in the stomach, allowing them to get into the small intestine and then overgrow. So that's one hypothesis top down from McCallum. Also, the release of things like bile and enzymes can open the door for SIBO because remember that what these bacteria are doing is they're helping us digest foodstuffs like fibers and certain carbohydrates that we can't. And so if the enzymes you release to break those foods down are insufficient, you're leaving more food on the table for the bacteria, and therefore the bacteria can overgrow. There's also the sort of bottom-up hypothesis from Mark Pimentel. This is more so centered around motility, meaning food doesn't move through the intestines at the appropriate pace. And if things aren't moving downward, what can happen is from the large intestine where the bacteria is quite rich, contents can reflux back upward and sort of seed the small intestine for bacterial overgrowth. This is typically what occurs when someone has had a bout of food poisoning or traveler's diarrhea, AKA acute gastroenteritis. You're either throwing up or having diarrhea or both. And after that, after that, what's typically a self-limiting infection clears. In the wake of that, autoimmunity against the motility apparatus forms leading food not to move at the appropriate pace and or reflux back upward and therefore overgrowing. And certain surgeries can also open the door of risk for SIBO either by shortening the length of the small intestine or by causing adhesions. And these adhesions create points where food kind of gets stuck or slows down, therefore the bacteria overgrow. It's important that food stuff moves through at the appropriate pace, like stagnant water fosters bacterial overgrowth, stagnant food does also. And then finally here, certain medications like non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, acid lowering medications, and potentially even chronic use of decongestants are all risk factors for SIBO. So then the question of how to test comes up. You cannot test or diagnose SIBO via a stool test, or via a urine test. You can get indications of intestinal health from these measures, but they're not diagnostic for SIBO. 
The gold standard, so to speak, is doing actual jejunal or duodenal aspirate, so taking a sample directly from the small intestine, which is quite invasive, and because of that, it's not routinely done. The best test, in my opinion, would be a breath test for SIBO. There is some debate over, do you want to use a test using lactulose as a solution that you drink as part of the test, or glucose? And to be honest, underneath the guidance of a good clinician, I think either test will be just fine. There is data showing that the glucose test is probably the most accurate because the lactulose test suffers from a high false positive. And just really quick here on the side, you drink a solution and then you do repeat breath samples every 20 minutes for about three hours. And the drink is where there's debate. With newer diagnostic criteria, namely from the North American consensus, you cut off the time interval that you interpret the test, thus safeguarding against overinterpretation. So by 90 or 100 minutes, if you see an elevation of gases after that, that does not mean that there's a, a, a positive test. Let me just step back for a moment and say that I don't recommend testing. And of course, you always want to follow your doctor's recommendations. But after doing SIBO breath testing for a number of years, in fact, we even have a study that's under submission to a peer-reviewed journal in what we were doing in the clinic studying treatment for SIBO. So as someone who's done plenty of testing, I don't recommend it any longer. And the reason why, the, the note I made a moment ago that 30 to 40% of people with these symptoms, that, that broad cast of symptoms will have SIBO, that's true. But consider that far more people will respond to therapies for SIBO than have SIBO. So if we look at probiotics, which can, which can treat SIBO, antibiotics, herbal antimicrobials, elemental diets, and we'll detail these more in a moment, far more people will respond to those therapies than have SIBO positive. So if you use the test and say, well, I'm not going to use antimicrobial, antibiotic, elemental diet therapy unless someone has a positive test, what the test may do is stand in the way of you and a therapy that could help you. So there's a time and a place for testing, but I, I think it's become too commonplace for clinicians nowadays to look to tests and to treat numbers. And they've really kind of stopped listening intently to the patient and treating them and their symptoms. That doesn't work for everything. If you have an anemia, if you have hypothyroidism, for example, that's not really going to lend itself well to an empiric or experimental approach. But for digestive symptoms, I think that's really the best way to handle things. And so this begs the question, what are the treatments? Well, the first, being a food first sort of healthcare provider, would be a low FODMAP diet. I'll share with you here a study I found very interesting. In only two weeks, they found that a low FODMAP diet alone could lead to a 30% resolution of SIBO if they combined the low FODMAP diet with a probiotic, specifically Saccharomyces boulardii, they had a 40% resolution rate of SIBO in only two weeks. So if this study was four, six, eight weeks, I would think we'd see a markedly higher rate of resolution of SIBO. Probiotics. You will sometimes hear experts say not to use probiotics with SIBO. And the one point I would want to make here is that Expert opinion is the lowest form of scientific evidence. Now, the highest form of scientific evidence, and I'll share with you the model here that evidence-based healthcare is built upon, are systematic reviews and or meta-analyses. So enter a systematic review that found about a 50% resolution rate of SIBO when using probiotic therapy alone. This is where we want to make a data-driven decision and not listen to the opinion of experts. And thankfully here, we have the pinnacle level of scientific evidence that tells us probiotics are a safe and viable therapy for SIBO. Now, you've likely also heard of the antibiotic rifaximin, which is FDA approved to treat the symptoms of IBS, but can also treat SIBO successfully. And this is where a separate meta-analysis found about a 50% response rate or resolution rate of SIBO when using antibiotics. But guess what? If you combine probiotics with antibiotics, you hit about a 85% resolution rate of SIBO, which is why I personally recommend to start with probiotics, reevaluate after about a month if they're working continue, if they're only partially moving the needle. That's when a combination of adding a antibiotic on top of a probiotic 
I feel to be the most advisable. Now, if you're not comfortable with antibiotics, thankfully, there are a few studies finding that herbal antimicrobials, things like oregano, are about as effective as rifaximin. In fact, we have currently under submission also a what I think will be the third publication to date documenting that herbal therapy alone is sufficient to eradicate SIBO. And of course, there are antibiotics, and I think the antibiotic rifaximin is safe, well-tolerated, well-studied, and certainly an option. In addition to all this, there is the elemental diet. Now, the elemental diet is essentially a meal replacement, but one that's been formulated to be hypoallergenic and will starve bacteria because it doesn't contain any of those materials, the foodstuffs, namely of prebiotics and fiber that feed bacteria. And so if you do have an overgrowth of bacteria, a high fiber diet, a high prebiotic diet, which can be healthy, might actually be triggering. And so for some of you watching this, if you've noticed, boy, when I eat a lot of onions, garlic, broccoli, cauliflower, you know, vegetables in general, I tend to feel more gassy and bloated. This could indicate that you have SIBO and that at least a temporary lower FODMAP diet or lower prebiotic diet could help. And this is exactly what the elemental diet is formulated to do, just in a meal replacement that's also formulated, again, to be hypoallergenic. Okay, so that's a, a recap of what SIBO is, why it's relevant due to its impact on the small intestine, a few things that you can do to remedy SIBO, and remember that you have a lot of power in your hands to take stock of your symptoms, and then experiment with therapeutics that can be helpful. I would always do so underneath the guidance of a healthcare provider, but I try to be fairly diligent about making the delineation between when do we absolutely need to test. Because if we don't do this, you end up seeing people who are spending thousands of dollars on testing when a simple and safe and, and healthcare provider overseen trial on a probiotic, on an elemental diet, on an herbal might be sufficient to remedy their symptoms and correct whatever imbalance is underlying that, which could be SIBO, but could also be similar but different things to SIBO. So SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, because it impacts the crucially important small intestine, can lead to a number of symptoms. And there are a few therapies that are safe and effective that you can discuss with your doctor or your healthcare team that should be able to improve your symptoms fairly quickly and allow you to have healthy and robust intestinal function and therefore systemic health. All right, guys, this is Dr. Ruscio, and I hope this helps. 